Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobray. Father, thank you for the joy that is involved in the differences between men and women. And thank you for the wonderful institution of marriage. What a delight it must be to you to see two become one. And Father, tonight as we open the word, we ask that you'd open our hearts. As we open our eyes, Lord, to hear and to see what you would have for us, Lord God, open the eyes of our understanding. Holy Spirit, you are the teacher tonight of these things, and Lord, I ask that you would teach through me tonight. May I say the things that you want said, and may there be a clarity and a truth, and may there be revelation and Father, I thank you for the grace that you give us to do what you demand for us to do in your word. So now, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for the bread of life as we open your word, open our hearts, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we are going to Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading out of the King James Bible, and I'm starting in Ephesians chapter 5, and I'll be reading verse... 22 and moving all the way through verse 33 wives submit to your own husbands as to the lord for the husband is head of the wife as also christ is head of the church and he is the savior of the body therefore just as the church is subject to christ so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. So tonight we're going to be looking at commandment number three for the, for the wife. Commandment number one for the wife was wives submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Commandment number two was wives let your husband be the head of the house. And commandment number three tonight is wives reverence your husbands or respect your husbands. And so tonight we're going to be looking at that word reverence or respect and what does that mean and wives, reverence your husband. And so God says to me, Debbie Cobray, who is the wife of Jim Cobray, and when we married almost 35 years ago, January 20th, we'll have been married, was it the 20th? I forgot our anniversary. (laughs) It's what? I know. It's not December, it's November. In two months, we'll have been married almost 35 years. You forgot our anniversary, too. We're we're batting 100 here. Okay. January 20th, we got married 1979. So we will be married 35 years, January 20th, 2014. 35 years ago on January 20th, we'll be married 35 years. And when we got married 35 years ago, January 20th, (laughs) forget it (laughs) I said vows to him and I in my vows I wrote my own vows and one of the vows I wrote was this not realizing that I was going to be under him and I was going to be a pastor's wife and I had no idea I would be ever standing in a place like this teaching on marriage I mean the man had been divorced three times I had been married and lived with everybody else. We were the mess of messes. 
But we were so excited about Jesus, and we were so in love with Jesus. And when we found each other, we found Jesus, and we found everything and the Word of God. We were so hungry to do things the right way that when we wrote our vows, we looked into the Word of God. And Jim wrote vows to me, and he wrote eight commandments, and I wrote vows to him. And I wrote them out of 1 Peter chapter 3, and I called him Lord. I said, as, er as Sarah called Abraham Lord, under the Lord Jesus Christ in my vows I said so I call you Lord under the Lord Jesus Christ not realizing what I was saying boy I had no idea what I was saying <laughs> but as the as time marched on and as we began to enter into married life I began to realize that this was a huge commandment and it was so important and reverence to a man is as important to a man as love is to a woman. As a matter of fact, as love is to a woman, so is reverence to a man. It is so important to the male heart that if a woman does not reverence her husband, it's as if she does not love him. Men, can I get a witness on that? I don't know why men are wired that way, but God has formed the, the male heart in his image and it is made in such a way women now this is it's time for us to get savvy about how God's made the sons that men must have respect and honor and reverence and when we respect them that is as if we loved them and when we don't respect them that is as if we do not love them so it's very important that we understand this because we can love them and not respect them and we think that everything's okay but it's not okay and god is saying to us women they are the head of the house you are to come under their authority we've already covered all that i'm not going to go over that again but now god says wives see that you reverence and respect your man your husband now i want to look at that tonight and i want to look at what does that mean to reverence our husbands what does that mean to respect? What does that mean to my husband, your husband? And what does the word of God have to say about that? Because if this is the way that I can love Jim, and if this is what rings his bell and what's going to cause him to be a godly man, then I better learn how to do this, and I better learn how to do this well. And when Jim comes up here and begins to teach the commandments to the men about loving your wife as Christ loved the church, he's going to begin to teach about men, how do you love your woman and how do you bring her into this place of being so secure in your love that she's willing to love you and reverence you. Because it works both ways. But girls, we're not going there. We're going to go to our place, our commandments. So are you ready? What does it mean? To reverence your husbands well I'm glad you asked and to do that we're actually going to the Amplified Bible and it really spells it out better than any place I've ever seen it over the 35 years I've almost been married in first Peter chapter 3 and we're going to the Amplified and I'm gonna have it on the board for you so in the Amplified Bible and I'm gonna read it in first Peter chapter 3 and I'll have it up on the overhead and then we're gonna look at this piece by piece is that all right and then, girls, we're going to look at how do we do this in the natural, all right? Because there's a secret to this. There's a mystery to this. Nothing in the kingdom of God is going to come easily. What do I mean by that? When you got married and I got married, we got married and we live in this world. But when we got born again, we got translated out of the kingdom of darkness we got translated into the kingdom of God I'm in this world but I'm not of it right so a Christian marriage we dwell on the earth in the natural I mean we're living in a natural world but I'm not of a natural kingdom so if I'm gonna have a supernatural marriage I'm going to have to access a supernatural kingdom and learn how to do marriage God's way I cannot access a supernatural kingdom if I'm living in the flesh, in the natural world. You cannot take the arm of the flesh and access the supernatural kingdom. Jesus said, I've given you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth, you can bind in heaven. Whatever you bind on the earth, 
Whatever is bound on the earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in the heavens. You know that Ma Matthew chapter 16, right? Verse 18. Are you with me? Yes. We're having a Bible study right now, okay? I don't want to go through all of this again. You guys, you're tracking with me, right? All right, so if he's given us keys to the kingdom, if he says, fear not, little flock, it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, then I've got keys that are going to unlock things, supernatural things, right? Well, you will never unlock supernatural things with the arm of the flesh. Never. You cannot get from God anything by the arm of the flesh or by the power of the flesh. You can't. It won't work. That's why you have to access the spirit realm and the supernatural by the arm of the spirit and by the spirit. That's why we have to do this by the realm of the spirit. We can't do this in the natural. If I want to have a good marriage, I can't do what my mom and dad did. I have to do what God says to do. I can't do what Joe Blow down the street does or what Sister Sally does down the street or what they say to do, what Dr. Laura says on, on the radio or what this Oprah says on television or what, you know, Woman's Live tells me to do. I've got to do what God tells me to do because if I want to have a supernatural relationship, I'm going to use a supernatural system and I have to obey a supernatural God. Are you with me? And sometimes it makes no sense in the natural. Hello? So if some of the things, girls, I'm going to say tonight are going to rub you the wrong way, hang on until the end because we're going to get there on how to do it. So this is a supernatural thing, reverence. Now, I started this message tonight, and I said, and I talked about good. Did I not? God is good. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 21, and Jim was there on Wednesday night. This was the first verse I taught my kids when they went to bed at night. And I'm just going to quote it to you. I'm not going to turn there. It says, do not be overcome with evil but overcome evil with good. Let me say it again. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's say it again. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, I'm talking about warfare, and I'm talking about spiritual dominion. In a marriage, in the natural, you are going to have a war going on between wills. There's going to be the man's will, and there's going to be the woman's will. When the marriage and the honeymoon is over, when suddenly you have lived together so many years, when, the, when everything is no longer new and fresh and you actually begin to hook in to the every days of life and the pressures come on you and life begins to happen, you will have opportunity to not have a romantic, wonderful, Prince Charming, honeymoon kind of a marriage. Can I get a witness in this house? And that is when you have to know how to access these keys to the kingdom of God to have a supernatural marriage to overcome evil with good because the enemy wants to divide and conquer because a house cannot stand if it's divided. And Satan will do everything he can to divide a husband and a wife and to split up a home and to split up a marriage so he can split up the children, so he can shipwreck the destinies of what God has already planned for that godly seed and that godly union. And that is why we've got to get savvy about this and understand that there are generations at stake and there is more at stake here than how we feel or what we like or what we think or any of that kind of foolishness. But there are generations and there are destinies and there's the plan of God and the will of God at stake. If Jim and I had divorced at an early age, this child church would never be here right now because we would have disqualified ourselves from leadership. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Don't think the enemy doesn't want to split you up. Women, this commandment could possibly be the most important one 
that we need to understand. Reverence. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And God says that we are to do this when our husbands are not obeying the word of God. When it's hardest to do this, this is when God says, this is your tactic and your strategy in the spirit to not be overcome with the evil that is coming against him, but to overcome that evil with the power of goodness through the kingdom of God, through the power of reverence that will be working in your life to your husband. Because again, if you can get this, if you can understand that this is not about how we feel, it's not about him and it's not about me, but it's about kingdoms. It's about where we're living and what we're doing and who we are and the power and authority that we carry. And that if we can get an agreement and if we can stay in love and walk in the love of God and walk in the power of God, there is not a devil in hell or one loosed on the earth that can split us up and stop us from the plan of God and what God wants to do in our lives. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I am talking legacy and destiny. So there's always more than just a happy marriage. There's destiny involved. So what does it mean to reverence your husband? Amplified, 1 Peter chapter 3. In like manner, you married women, be submissive to your own husbands, subordinate yourselves, as being secondary to and dependent on them and adapt yourselves to them so that even if any do not obey the word of God. Wait a minute, God. These guys are acting like bozos, some of them. They're not obeying the word of God. You want me to do this when they're not obeying the word of God? Yes. They may be one. They may be one. They may be one. Not by discussion, but by the godly life of their wives. When they observe the pure and modest way in which you conduct yourself, together with your reverence for your husband, you are to feel for him all that reverence includes, to respect him, to defer to him, to revere him, to honor to esteem, to appreciate, to prize, and in the human sense, to adore. That is to admire, praise, be devoted to, deeply love, and enjoy your husband. Amen. <laughs> now, God says to do this when they're not obeying the word of God. Do it when they are and do it when they're not. Why? Because there's a power that is at work in the kingdom that is overcoming that evil. Last week I taught about the, the power of meekness. That meekness is the power of God. It's power, meekness, power under the control of agape love. It was demonstrated at the cross of Jesus Christ when the lamb swallowed up the dragon. When Jesus went to the cross, he looked defeated and weak. And yet that lamb, that crucified lamb, the sacrificial lamb, took the keys of death and hell and he shook the very gates of hell and that psalm that says open wide ye gates open wide ye doors the prince of glory comes in who is the prince of glory I submit to you it's not talking about the gates of heaven it is talking about the very gates of hell and it shook it down and he took the keys of death and hell and he absolutely led captivity captive and he absolutely destroyed Satan he absolutely destroyed him. So the lamb that looked weak destroyed the dragon that looked strong. The kingdom, it is opposite of this world. It is opposite of everything that we see. And that's what Jesus came to do is to teach and to preach the kingdom. 
He said, fear not, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He's the king. And he is the king of this amazing kingdom. Listen, the earth cannot contain him. The heavens cannot contain him. He is the king of kings. And this kingdom is so vast and so absolutely incredible. And we are inheritors of the kingdom. And there is nothing that is impossible as we are the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. And we are in bride training. And when we begin to understand these things and we learn them in our marriage are you understanding any of this there's a bigger picture here do you realize that we could even learn how to be a better bride through the women they understand things that the sons don't understand and women we can learn how to be sons through the sons because they understand things we don't understand this isn't a jockeying for positions this is not a who gets what. This is a learning together how to be one in Christ. I hope I'm making some sense. We worry too much about who does what and who's in charge. We need to instead learn how to walk in the love of God and the meekness of the Spirit and let Jesus rule in our lives and watch what God will do in our marriages. And when our husbands, if they're not obeying the word of God, I've had countless counselings on this over the years with women. Marriage is on the brink of disaster, ready to divorce. And we've gone to 1 Peter chapter 3. And I cannot tell you how many times in my office we've been on our knees praying, asking for the grace of God to give these women strength to do this. Because God doesn't ask the men. He knows his sons are stubborn. He knows his men. He knows his boys. He made them. He knows men, girls will not listen. He knows that. And this is not manipulation. This is goodness. This is do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. God is good. Benefit and blessing that overwhelms the darkness. So he says, your husbands will not obey the word of God. And they won't be won by your preaching. They won't come to church with you. They won't do what you want them to do. But if you'll do this, the goodness and the power that is in this action and love for them will take their hearts and will captivate their man heart and will draw them into the power of the love of God and the kingdom of God. And they'll come into their destiny. So are you interested, women, on what this is? Because this is powerful stuff. So God says, wise up, girls. Learn how to understand the man that I've given to you. Learn how to live with this man with understanding. Men in reverence. Men need three things. There was a book, a great book called Wild at Heart. I read it, and there was three things I learned about my man in this book. A man, according to this book, needs a battle to fight. When I was on the road so many times, I'd come home, and I'd turn on the television, and I, could always, I would always know what Jim had watched. Two things, boxing and the Weather Channel. There it was, <laughs> boxing and the Weather Channel. Men need a battle to fight. I don't know what it is about you guys, but you just have that testosterone, and you just fight battles. There it is. Is that true? Is that true? <laughs> you need a beauty to rescue. That's your own princess. She may be an old beauty, but she's yours. And you need an adventure to live. Men need something to do. God gave Adam a job before he ever gave Adam a wife. He tended the garden. Men are identified by what they do. Women are identified by how they look. You ever thought about that? But men have always identified by what they do. Fact, reverence to a man is what love is to a woman. If you want to love your husband, then learn to reverence him. 
men and life. Men live in a world of competition with other men. They live in a world of battles. They live in a world of inadequacy. Women live in a world of insecurity. Men need to be needed and wanted. A woman's femininity will bring forth a man's masculinity and strength if she's truly a woman of God. You are to feel for him all that reverence includes, to respect, defer, revere, honor, esteem, appreciate, prize, in the human sense, adore, admire, praise, be devoted to, deeply love, and enjoy your husband. So let's just look and see what some of those words mean. To defer to him, what does that mean? It means yield, give way. You ever seen a big yellow yield sign? It means, ah, stop, he gets his way. Adapt, learn what he likes, and go with the flow. Girls, God's wired us to be more adaptable than the man. Just that's the way we're wired. We can do it. You're wired that way. Let him have his way. It's okay. It's called reverence. My husband, this is crazy, and this is, Dan, you can check off the bathroom reference because here it is. That's a private family joke, but if you've been here any time, you'll know what I'm talking about. Jim likes the toilet paper with the roll over the toilet paper. <laughs> How many like it that way? I like the toilet paper the other way, under. Anybody like it that way? So when I put the toilet paper on the roll, it's always over because he likes it that way. That's how he likes it. That's how it is in our house. It's always over because my husband likes it that way. My husband likes his eggs hard. He doesn't like them soft. So when I cook his eggs, I cook them hard. I don't know how he eats them like that, but that's what he likes. My husband likes pound cake. He, I mean, he likes fruit cake. So he goes to Costco and buys it himself. <laughs> we, are to we are to esteem our husbands. What does that mean? Outside of God, that man is the most important thing in your life. That means when you do your schedule and you've got to go somewhere, you want to do something, you don't check with anybody until you check with him. He's the first one on the schedule. And I learned this early on in our marriage that I didn't book my schedule until I got permission from my husband if it was okay. Eleanor and I went to downtown Los Angeles yesterday and I didn't say yes to her until I made a phone call to Jim and he was in Orange County and I said, can I? skip the Sabbath service this weekend. Can we go shopping for Women on the Rock, the rock shop? And it, because we've got a store and we've got girlfriends and we've got GNO coming up. And I said, can I do that? And he said, absolutely, it's okay. But I didn't, make, I didn't say yes until I first called my husband. It's just 35 years of habit. I learned that early on. Girls, it's habit, but you check with your husband first. It's just what God tells us to do. It's how we do life. Now, maybe the world doesn't do that, but we're Christian women and we do that. That's how we do life. It means that we esteem them. Outside of God, they are the most important person in our world. They're more important than the children. The children are important and we're gonna raise our children. They're more important than the grandchildren. They're our husbands. The grand, listen, the kids are gonna grow up and leave. You raise your kids to leave. But that man's gonna be with you until you die or he dies. And God says esteem them and make them the most important people in your house. Appreciate him, what does that mean? It means that you don't take your husband for granted. It's so easy to get used to living with each other and taking each other for granted. It's easy to live with these incredible human beings, these sons of God and these daughters of God, and this works both ways. It means that we learn to continue to be kind to each other, to say thank you, to appreciate each other, to don't, to don't be common with each other, but when, when you do something for each other, you know what's kind is, is when you make the bed for each other, or when you do the dishes. You know, if, if, you, if, you do the, if you make a mess in the kitchen, clean it up. And if, if the spouse cleans it up, say thank you. Sometimes I've worked all day and I've come home and Jim's made a mess and he's cleaned it up. I need to say thank you. Sometimes I've worked all day and I've come home and he's made a mess and he hasn't cleaned it up. And I don't say thank you. <laughs> but he, that man will get out the vacuum cleaner and vacuum. He'll do laundry. 
He's a good man. We're, we're married to good men. I'm married to a man that's not going to trample on my heart. I'm married to a man that loves me like Christ loves the church. So it's easy for me to say this. Some of you aren't married to men like that. I'm married to an incredible man of God. And I know that. And that's why we've got, I've got to get to page six of my notes. So I need to move on because some of you aren't. And I don't want to leave you hanging. So let's just go through this quickly. Don't compare our husbands with others. My friend Eleanor Becker and Sue Bryan, both of them have taught me some things about comparison. When you compare, somebody always gets smaller. So it's a dangerous thing to compare. Women, don't compare your husband with somebody else. I remember I was preaching once in the other building and I was teaching on this. And somebody yelled out, yeah, but you're married to Pastor Jim and we love Pastor Jim. That was a stupid thing to yell out. She was comparing her husband with my husband. Don't go home and compare your husband with Pastor Jim because you're not married to Pastor Jim and you don't know what I go home with. <laughs> that didn't come out right. <laughs> I go home with a hero. But to compare your man with Jim or your man with Pastor Luke or Pastor Dan or Pastor Joel or Pastor Becker, or any of the pastors here, is a dangerous thing. That's a stupid thing to do. You didn't marry them. You married your man. And God says your man has the potential to be a son in the house of God if you'll do these things. You can work with the Holy Spirit. If any do not obey the word, it says in 1 Peter chapter 3, they'll be one, not by your conversation. You cannot preach them into this behavior, but you can behave your way and show them the love of God, and that can change their man heart. Am I making any sense, girls? What every woman ought to know, God says, prize him. What does that mean? It means spend time with him. Spend time doing life with him. Show him that he's more important than anything else. In the book, What Every Woman Ought to Know, and I've read so many books on marriage, Shanti Feldman wrote this. I got in trouble for this the last time I taught on marriage, but I'm gonna say it anyway, and girls, don't write me letters. Don't get mad at me. I'm gonna tell you the truth, whether you wanna hear it or not. I'm sorry. So I'm just going to preface this with, I'm sorry if this offends you. But this is the fact. She did a, a survey, and this is what came out in this survey, okay? So don't blame me. I'm just sharing information with you. What every woman ought to know. And this is what men said in, in the survey. Men care about what their wives look like, but what they're afraid to say. Men care that their wives take care of themselves. What is God saying? Take care of yourself because you prize your husband. Prize yourself. Don't let yourself go. Now look, I'm 63 years old. I look in the mirror and I'm under some high definition cameras and I don't like being on camera with you anymore. <laughs> I'm not a young woman. I like to put Jess up here. She's gorgeous. But I'm going to be the best 63 I can be for Jim. And he's going to be the best 68 he can be for me. And we look at each other, and he's Santa, and I'm Mrs. Claus. <laughs> and we chase each other around the house as Santa and Mrs. Claus, and I'm baking him cookies for Christmas. But we're going to be the best we can be for each other. Your husband's not asking you to be a size 3. But he is asking you to take care of yourself for him. Girls, don't let yourselves go. Don't get so discouraged with life and your marriage that you don't care anymore about you. Care about you. That Proverbs 31 woman, she cares about herself. She makes beautiful clothes for herself. It doesn't cost a lot of money to have beautiful clothes. Look, I know what it's like to be broken. I know how to go to some great thrift stores. Man, let me tell you, Newport Beach, Santa Barbara, there's some really good thrift stores down there. I can show you the best places to go. We can go shopping and it doesn't cost a lot of money. If the barn needs to be painted a little bit, paint the barn. It's okay. That's your man and you're his crown. The wife is the crown of the husband. The crown signifies the dignity and the rank of the man. You are his trophy woman. 
Now, you may not look in a mirror and think you're all that, but you know what? That man loves you. My husband tells me all the time, you are beautiful. Do I believe him? No, but he thinks I'm beautiful. He believes I'm beautiful. And if your man believes you're beautiful, then believe it. Be beautiful for him. They love us. Let them love us. Girls, this is romance. This is part of the love dance that God's made between a man and a woman. Charm is deceiving and beauty is vain because it's passing. But you can be beautiful at every age. Every age can be beautiful. So men care about how we look. Take a bath, comb your hair, put on some makeup, <laughs> clean yourself up, clean up the house, pick it up. Men like to come home to a clean house, but that, we're going to get into that later on. Am I getting too up close and personal? We've got to take care of these men. There are men. It's part of reverencing them. God says, listen, adore them. I don't want to adore that man. God says, adore him in the human sense. Well, what does that mean? I can't adore him. Isn't that like idolatry, God? Well, in the human sense. So what does that mean? It means he's your hero man. What does that mean, hero man? Ah, oh. do you know that my son Luke, when he was a little boy, he dressed up in costumes. He was Superman, and he was Batman, and he was Spider-Man, and he was every kind of man he could be as a, as a kid. My grandsons all dress up. Little boys play at being heroes. Little girls play at being mommies and being princesses. Don't you think that that should be telling us something? Do you know how there is instinct in creation? The geese fly south in the winter. We call it instinct. Have you ever thought that maybe there are just shadows and instinct on the inside of humanity? Time began in a garden. Did you ever think that maybe there are shadows and instincts of royalty and dignity on the inside of humanity? That we were made to be amazing, beautiful, royal, lovely, incredible beings in the image of God. That we do better in beauty than we do in rubbish and rubble. Have you ever thought that maybe humanity was made for beauty and royalty? And that little boys are just acting out what they really are as heroes. And little girls are just acting out what they really are. Princesses, royal, nurturers, lovers. They're innocent still. God loves us. And a home and a marriage is filled with the goodness of God. And it's just a womb of love and potential and dreams for a marriage and people and vision and dream and children and destiny. And if we'll just come together and do what God says, then instead of splitting apart and hating each other and fighting, all of a sudden we begin to build and believe in each other. And the man and the woman find their spot and their place. And we grow up and we become these amazing creatures that love each other. And we, and we bring forth these children. And they grow up and become these amazing adults. And we have grandchildren and children's children and children's children. And the kingdom grows and things happen and destiny is set. It's bigger than us. And it all starts with just us doing our little piece, learning how to love each other in a marriage, learning how to simple things like learning girls how to just reverence our men. Make him your hero. I've called you my hero man since we got married. He's a big old guy. I love my big man. He's big. I, don't, I forget how big this man is. He is a very big man. And I like how big he is. You're a big guy. <laughs> I forget how big you are. God says part of reverence is to admire him. Marvel at them. Wonder at their strength. I asked him to grow his beard back. You know why? Because I can't grow a beard. 
But I just think it's so sexy. I mean, I think it's so awesome that he gets hair in his face. How does he do that? I admire that. He likes me with my curves. He doesn't want to be married to something angular and muscular. He likes to touch something that he sinks into. <laughs> Which makes me feel good because he's really sinking into me now. <laughs> well, anyway. Part of reverencing is to praise them, compliment and encourage, be devoted to them, loyal and trustworthy. The Proverbs 31 woman, it says, a Proverbs 31 woman, it says in Proverbs, I love the Proverbs 31 woman because that's girls, that's who we are. It's not who we're supposed to be, it's who we are. It's our DNA. We just don't understand that's who we really are. That's in us. And it says the heart of her husband safely trusts in her. It safely trusts. She is the safety deposit box for his dreams and visions. He can trust her with his dreams. He can trust her with his visions. There's nobody else he can go to, but he knows he can go to his girl. He knows he's got his wife, and he knows that he can tell her anything. As crazy as it may sound, she's not going to laugh at him. She's not going to push him away. She's going to believe with him, and she's going to say, if this is what you think it is, then let's go for it. Let's jump off the cliff again. Let's go for broke, and let's do it. The heart of her husband safely trusts in her. And he has no need for any dishonest gain. He doesn't have to go anything dishonest because he knows his woman is going to be there when he comes home. She's not going to be out running after somebody else. He can trust her. She's going to be there. Whether there's good times or whether there's bad times. That's part of reverence. God says, deeply love and enjoy your husband. That means some good sex, girls. Good sex. The marriage bed is undefiled, and that means we can have some really good times. And we're supposed to. It belongs to us. It doesn't belong outside of marriage. That's all I'm going to say about it because I'm out of time, but it belongs to marriage. And God says, enjoy it. I invented it. It's good. Have fun. Play together. Encourage. Go on an adventure. So much to say. Some things I learned about Reverence and Jim over the years. Sometimes I've been great at this, sometimes I've been not so great at this. And I'm not going to ask Jim how great I've been at this because I don't want his opinion right now. <laughs> Number one, girls, never undress your husband in public. What does that mean? It means that you're careful what you say about your man and how you say it. Teasing is not done in a way that would make him look weak or less than a man. You don't discuss personal things with your girlfriends. You keep that private. You keep things hidden in your heart. It's between you and your husband. Two, respect his decisions and don't say, I told you so. Even though you are so tempted to say, I told you so, don't say it. Three, love him enough to take care of yourself. You're his crown. Reflect your love for him. Proverbs 12, 4 says, an excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who causes shame is like rottenness in his bones. Now, I want to just quickly say a word to wives with ungodly men when it's hard to reverence your men. God says this is how you do what he's asking you to do when they don't obey the word of God. How do you do this? I'm going to give you a scripture, Matthew 7:12. Here is a simple rule of thumb, and it's in the Message Bible. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. Add up God's law and prophets, and this is what you get. It's the law of relationships, the law of mutual exchange. It's the law of the kingdom. You get what you give, you eat what you serve, you reap what you sow. What is God saying? It's a law in the kingdom. It's overcoming evil with good. You're exercising a kingdom law. Listen to me, girls. It's law. It's kingdom law. It's going to overrule darkness. You have got to do first what you want him to do to you. 
what do you want him to do to you? You've got to grab the initiative and do it first. According to the golden rule, according to Matthew 7, 12, what you want somebody to do to you, God says you do it first to them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He wanted us to love him. He loved us first. Are you with me? It's the law of relationships. Are you with me? Do it first. How do you want to be treated? Then treat him that way. If you want to be beat up and hated, then beat up and hate him. You want to be loved and nurtured, then love and nurture him. It's the law. Two, do it in faith by grace. You're not going to access anything in the flesh. You're going to have to do it by faith by grace. Grace. What is grace? God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. Grace. What is my definition of grace? God's ability in me to do what his truth demands of me. When God says I'm to reverence my husband when he's not obeying the word of God, and I say, God, I cannot do that. God says, Debbie, there is a grace that is available to you that will give you the power to reverence him and access into this grace is available to you, but you're going to have to access it by faith. You're going to have to step in and do it first. And by faith, you're going to have to start doing it. In other words, you don't do it by feeling. You don't do it by touch, by sight, by smell. You do it by faith and you trust that God's going to give you the power to do it. And you do it one day at a time. Are you with me, girls? One day at a time, and you do it by grace. And number three, you're going to have to live in a world of forgiveness and forgive quickly and often. That is going to be your world. Forgive quickly. You're going to have to forgive thousands of times a day. Because if you don't, you won't be able to do this. Because this man's not going to turn right away. It could get worse before it gets better. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. You're in a war, and it's a war over the soul of that man you're married to, and the enemy wants to destroy him, and God wants him to be completely and absolutely delivered out of darkness into the kingdom. And you are the warrior princess that is helping the Holy Spirit. And the enemy wants you to be so discouraged, you give up and say, forget it. And God's saying, can you trust me? Can you step into this power of reverence? And can you let me give you the grace to help you work and walk into this divine power of reverence in your marriage? I've seen it work. I've seen it happen over and over again. Forgive quickly. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. What does that mean? It means love keeps no record of being wronged. The word is legizomai, it means erases resentment. Love pulls out a big pencil and it erases resentment. So when somebody does something to you that wants to bug you, you just pull out the forgiveness pencil and you erase it right there. Because you're under the power of agape love. You say, no, I'm just going to erase it. I'm not resenting it. I'm erasing that. I'm erasing that. I'm erasing that, Jesus. I, I choose to come under the submission of love. I'm erasing that. I'm erasing that comment. I'm erasing that action. Oh, I'm erasing that. I will not think any evil. I'll not take into account a wrong suffered. I'm not going to go there, Lord. I'm not going to go there in my mind. I'm erasing that. I forgive in Jesus' name. And it doesn't mean that you do the silent treatment, that you withdraw yourself and you just get alone because you need your space. You see, that's not forgiving. No. Guys, this is kingdom stuff. It's crucifying the flesh. But if we really want to see our marriages get healthy, we're going to hunker down and we're going to learn how to do this. And we're going to grow up and we're going to be like Jesus. Girls, no, nobody said this was easy, but God said we could do it. God says there's grace for it. And God said we're going to see our children and our children's children. You know why I know this? I can tell you why I know this. My mom is 87 years old. My dad's going to be 88 in another month. My dad's in a convalescent hospital right now. He should be dead. He's been dying for 25 years. My mom 
has been married to my dad for 67 years. He's in a convalescent hospital. She's in a retirement center. And she sees him about 10 times a day. She walks across the street from their little apartment. And he has broken his hip. And his kidney is failing. And he is dying. And every day I call her. And every day she says, oh, it's so sad, Debbie. She said, but every day I hear his voice and I take my phone to bed with me and he calls me three times a night. He calls me at midnight. He calls me at three o'clock in the morning. He calls me at six in the morning. And I'm just so glad to hear his voice because he's still on the earth. You see, my dad, there was a time when my dad wasn't faithful. There was a time when my dad broke her heart. There was a time when any normal woman would have left him a long time ago. But my mom was a Christian woman, and she said, I'm not leaving. I'm staying with your father. She came from a different stock and a different age and a different place. And my dad got saved. And God's given them 67 years together. I'm a product of their marriage. And my children and my children's children are a product of their marriage. And when we sit in this church and we sing hymns, tears come down my face because I remember my mother took me to a church alone without my father and we sang the hymns and she loved Jesus and she brought me to Christ legacy there's more at stake than how we feel in our broken hearts there are children and generations ahead of us that you don't know yet and your hearts may be broken, and you may be discouraged, and you may want to just give up and quit on each other. But if you won't, and if you'll stay together, and if you'll believe God, and if you'll forgive each other, God can heal your marriages. God can heal your hearts. God can make something beautiful out of something the enemy wanted to splinter apart and break open. Amen. Because I have seen it in my own family. And this is truth and it works. Wives, is it a difficult thing? It's going to take the love of God and the kingdom of God to do it. But you have a risen Savior. Whoever lives to make intercession for you. You have a place that you stand in the grace of God. You have the blood of Jesus and the promises of God. You have the faith of God. And you have everything you need to stand in a place of holiness and righteousness. And if you will believe God and stand with God, there is nothing that is impossible to those who will believe. So my question is, what do you want and how do you want it to happen? Because God says, with God, nothing is impossible. Wives, let's reverence our husbands. God is so good. God is so good. Hey, I want to talk to you guys before we leave this place. We've had a great time in the word of the Lord, and, and I really believe that we heard from God. It's a phenomenal message. Uh, whether you're a lady or a gentleman, You've heard the word of God today. We've experienced the presence of God. Let's not stop there. Some of you, if you haven't yet given God all of your heart, you haven't yet given God all of your life. Jesus said that you must be born again if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. I don't want you to leave this place. Your heart's not right with God. You die and end up in hell. That'd be a tragedy. Now, the world would like to tell us that hell doesn't exist, and yet I find in the Bible, Old and New Testament, even Jesus, all talk about hell. It's a very real place, and so let's make sure that you don't end up there. Sometimes people think all roads lead to heaven, that you do whatever you want to do, you be true to yourself, and that you're going to make it into heaven. And yet, why would Jesus say you must be born again if he's just leaving it up to whatever you want to do? See, he doesn't leave it up to your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. He says there's one way to heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You must be born again. That's God's way. Now, sometimes we think of being born again as just, you know, being good. That if you're a good person, that God sees your goodness and lets you into heaven. But can I tell you something? God is not some jolly old Saint Nick in the heavenlies making a list and checking it twice. So who's been naughty and who's been nice? It doesn't work like that. You can't be good enough to get into heaven. Sometimes we think church attendance or being raised in church or parents tell you you're a Christian. 
because you wore religious jewelry or attended religious classes, maybe because you were baptized or christened as a child, that that gets you into heaven. And yet, nowhere in the Bible does it say any of that will get you into heaven. You must be born again. Sometimes people think, well, my church attendance or, you know, because I got involved in my last church, I sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in the church. People thought of me as a leader. Sometimes we, we can think that that will get us into heaven. And yet nowhere in the Bible does it say church attendance or church involvement will get you into heaven. You must be born again. Sometimes people think being born again is just knowing who God is, being able to quote some scriptures or celebrate a holiday, sing some songs, that sort of a thing. And yet, if you'd read your Bible, you would know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's, they're not Christians. The devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and yet he's not a Christian. So everybody look up at me for a second. Being born again is not something that you have up here in your head. It's not about knowing who God is or being able to quote some scriptures, but rather it's about your heart. What does being born again really mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. Not what Hollywood or television or movies would make it out to be weirdo, crazy, all that kind of stuff. No one wants that. What it is is that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. When you give God your heart, he comes in and makes you brand new on the inside. You are now born again and learning how to live for him with all of your life for the rest of your life. That's why Jesus said, he who endures to the end will be saved. Today, I want to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. I'm going to pop my hand on this pulpit just like this. Bang. When you hear the sound of my hand pop on that pulpit just like that, bang. That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, yeah, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a second. Wait a second. Time out. You're going to point at me and count? I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be embarrassed. Let's get over that embarrassment tonight. Because think of the trade-off. If you ended up in hell, you'd raise everything you could, your hands, your feet, your underwear on a flagpole if you could, just to get out. But listen, there's no exits in hell. Let's make sure you don't get there tonight. Push past that embarrassment. Let's go all out for God. Say yes to Jesus by just simply raising your hand. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell. Jesus said these words. Listen, it's all or nothing with Jesus. He was speaking to a church in the book of Revelation. He said, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. What is he saying? Lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all. Tonight, check yourself out. Where are you at with God? Have you been born again? If not, come on. Or if you're lukewarm in this place, you say, what is that? Well, it's a little bit in, a little bit out, a little bit up, a little bit down. A little token prayer every now and again, occasional church attendance. God's something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship, you're not going to make it. Only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, your call, your choice. Will you give them all of your heart? Will you give them all of your life? Or will you sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right? Done my job. I've loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's done his job sending Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. Now it's your turn. Who should raise their hand? You've been running from God instead of to God. I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand? You're not sure about your salvation. Come on, today, make sure. Who should raise their hand? If you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, give them all of your heart and all of your life, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can get right with God in a moment. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching my television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or all over the world online. You can raise your hand, then click the blue button if you see it there, or if not, if you're on your mobile device, go to our homepage and click How to Know God. Someone will lead you in a prayer. I'm going to count to three, pop my hand on this pulpit. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. All together, here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one. There's two. There's three. There's four. There's five. There's six. Seven. Thank you. God bless you. Seven. Eight. Got you up there. Nine in the family room. Thank you. Nine wise people. Ten up in the family room. Got both of you guys. You can put your hand down right there. I got you as well. I think I got you guys. There's about ten wise people. Ten. Eleven and twelve. Thank you. God bless you guys. Who else? There's about a dozen wise people. If you haven't already yet given God all your heart and all of your life, but you're saying, yeah, I need to do this. I need to do this. Come on, if I didn't already see you, just pop it up when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else? Anybody else? 
All right, there's about 12 wise people. Now, listen, quickly, quickly, quickly. If you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand. Here's what I want you to do. Let's all stand, and as we give a clap and a shout, no one leave during this time. If you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand. Get your stuff, your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. Come on right now. Come on right now. Just make your way to the front. Ushers, let's help them from the family rooms. You can bring your kids if you want. Come on down. Come on down right now. Just make your way to the front. If that's you, you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand. You just come right now. Come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah, they're coming. They're coming. You can come too. You can come too. Anybody else, if you need to come, come on, just make your way to the front right now. They're coming, they're coming. Come on, there's room for you. We'll wait for you. They're still coming. Because you're all I want. Anybody else, even if you didn't raise your hand, come on, this is for you right now. Just make your way to the front. They're still coming. Come on. Come on. You can come too. There's room for you here. There's room for you here. Just make your way to the front right now. Come on down. Come on down. Hallelujah. They're still coming. They're still coming. Hey, we'll wait for you. Come on down. Come on down. Come on down. Yes. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. You're all I Awesome, awesome, awesome. It's okay. Come on, guys. Come on down. Hey, this is the best decision of your life right here. Such a good thing. So glad you guys have come. You can put a smile on your face. You did the right thing, all right? Came to give God all your heart. Came to give God all of your life. Just great. Right over here to my right, your left. See this guy in the black coat, black shirt? This is Pastor Joel. Real good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. Uh, I'm going to let you know what he's going to do in advance, okay, so you're not scared. He's going to pray with you a simple prayer to invite Jesus give you some free stuff, free information that'll help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God, introduce you to a friend we have in the church, okay? Free, all of it's free, all of it's easy, and then I'll let you come right back out, okay? Real simple stuff. So if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel. Let's give him a hand as they go right this way. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me. And then he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins. That I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.